Okay, uh, greetings. Uh, this is the second half of my lecture on the metaphysics and epistemology of Aristotle. And I'll be picking up where the other lecture left off, which was on Aristotle's doctrine of the four causes. So <clears throat> let me share my screen. And if I did this right, <laughs> we should both be looking at um, my slide on Aristotle's doctrine of the four causes. Now, <clears throat> um, don't be um, led astray by the word cause. Um, Aristotle is using the word cause or what's being translated as cause in a broader fashion than we use the word cause today. And he's using it basically as a form of um, the, the doctrine of the four explain, explainers, we can put it that way, right? In other words, to asking certain kinds of why questions, why does that object do this? Why does that object um, uh, have these qualities, et cetera? The why questions, they can be answered relative to uh, four different kinds of explanatory resources. And this is what he means by the doctrine of the four causes. We might call it the doctrine of the four B causes, right? Because of, or because, right? So the four causes that Aristotle identifies are material cause, efficient cause, formal cause, and final cause. And roughly material cause is um, what a thing is made of, right? What, what the substance of a thing. Efficient cause would be who or what generated it. Um, efficient cause is probably the closest to uh, what today we refer to as a cause. If I say, what caused the Chicago fire or what caused the stock market to crash or whatnot, I generally have in mind um, what stood in, in relation of cause to the effect. And that's kind of what he has in mind here for efficient cause. Actually, strictly speaking, he has a broader notion even of efficient cause than our notion of cause. So, um, but that's a, that's a detail we don't have to go into at this moment. Uh, formal cause is when you locate the thing within a, a species, uh, it's, a, it's a member of a class or a set, uh, it, and its membership in that set explains why it is a certain way, why it behaves a certain way, why it looks a certain way, et cetera, right? And that's its formal cause. And then the final cause would be, what is it supposed to do? What is its purpose? What is its function? The Greek word for function or purpose is telos, T-E-L-O-S. And the telos of a thing is its function or purpose. So that's what you're investigating when, uh, when Aristotle is looking at the final cause. And certain, and that explains certain features about an object. Uh, it is the way it is, or it behaves the way it is, because it's directed towards a particular end or goal or function. That's a teleological explanation coming again from the Greek word telos. So a teleological explanation is an explanation that references the purpose or the function or the goal of a thing. Right. So notice if I said um, uh, he skipped dessert because he's trying to lose weight, that would be a teleological explanation of uh, his behavior. Or if I said uh, the function of the heart is to pump blood, that's a teleological description of the heart. Right. I'm describing the heart in terms of its purpose or its function or its goal. Right? All right. So those words will come up again. That's why I'm referencing it. Oh, this isn't working. It still isn't working. Okay, so there we are. So imagine, for instance, a thousand years from now, someone is digging around in his backyard and he comes across a curious object that he can see is very old, but he doesn't know what it is. He wants to find out. So he takes it to a chemist friend of his and he says to his chemist friend, what is this? And his chemist friend replies, well, I can tell you what that is. Uh, that is steel and iron and chrome. And there's also a little bit of rubber here. Well, despite the fact that what the chemist has said is true, our discoverer is not satisfied. Yes, that's fine, he says to himself, but what is it? So he takes it to another friend of his, this time an economic historian. What is this, he asks. Oh my, that's an artifact, that is, she says. It was designed by Franz Wagner. It was produced in the Underwood factories in New York sometime in the very early 1900s. Okay, so now this guy knows how it came to be and who made it, but still, what is it? He sees a third friend, an archeologist this time. 
Yes, I'm certain I can help you, his friend says. I know precisely what that is. That is an Underwood number five. It is very similar to the Densmore, but differs from that kind in that it's a four bank front strike version. It differs from the Doherty in that it was less likely to have key jams. Well, now our discoverer understands the object's type. That is, he can recognize another one of the same type. Right? So, oh, look, there's another one of those things, right? So he knows its type or its form. He can see and distinguish it from things of a different type, like the Doherty or the, Dens uh, or the Densmore. He knows the class of things toward, uh, to which it belongs. That is, he knows its form. But there's a sense in which he still does not know what this thing is. Finally, finally, he takes it to an expert on religion and culture from the early 20th century. I understand your difficulty, she says. You know what it's made of, material cause. You know how it came to be, efficient cause. You know the class of things to which it belongs, formal cause. But what you want to know is what is it supposed to do? What is it for, final cause? Well, I can help you there. This was called a typewriter. This was a machine by which people in the early 20th century communicated with their gods. They would sit in front of it all day and use the keyboard to type messages of praise and petitions for help from the deities. Now, another friend is walking by and overhears this and says, what? Don't be ridiculous. That is not the telos of this thing. The telos of this machine was to make music. It was a percussive instrument and people used to play all sorts of complicated rhythms throughout the day. Note the little bell on the side. Ding. Well, if our discoverer believed either of these two stories, he would be wrong, of course. And there's a sense in which he would still not know what this thing is. He would still not know what the telos of the typewriter was, and thus his knowledge of the typewriter would be consequently incomplete, despite the fact that he knew the material cause, the efficient cause, and the formal cause. He would still not know the final cause of the object. And of course, he could not tell a good one from a bad one. So notice if he can't tell what it's supposed to do, he can't evaluate it as to whether it does the things it's supposed to do well, or whether it does the things it's supposed to do poorly, or whether it doesn't do the things it's supposed to do at all, right? because he doesn't know what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> My point here is that Aristotle thinks we need to know all the four causes of an object in order to really understand that object. Knowing what a thing is, science, requires knowing all the causes of a thing. Now, um, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas defines philosophy as the science of all things and their causes investigated through unaided human reason alone. So remember, Aquinas was quite the Aristotle fanboy. He believes in Aristotle's um, idea of what science should be about. He sees philosophy as a kind of science where rather he sees philosophy and science as, as coextensive, right? And, um, and so what, the philosopher is interested in no less than the scientist are the causes of things and to understand the causes of things. Uh, we had a major a couple of years ago that was accepted to a European university, uh, the, <clears throat> the motto of which was in Latin and it was happy is he who knows the causes of things. And so it's this sort of uh, uh, probably a medieval uh, um, slogan <coughs> coming from the scholastic uh, tradition, uh, which was very much influenced by Aristotle. For items in the natural world, especially living natural things, the formal cause is the final cause of a thing. So let me just pause here a moment. So what is the um, formal cause of a cat? Cat nature. And what is it that cats are supposed to do? Exhibit cat nature. In other words, the formal cause, the kind of thing that it is, is the final cause, the kind of thing that it's supposed to be. That is, a thing's nature is what a substance is supposed to do, what it will do if nothing stops it, for instance, uh, natural tendency. Right? Now, notice in the case of cats, not, I seem to be fixated on cats, I apologize, but anyway, um, notice not only is the formal cause of a thing, cat nature, also the final cause of the thing, what it's supposed to do, cat telos, right, 
It's also the efficient cause of the thing, because where did that cat come from? Mommy and daddy cat, right? And so the cat was produced by cat nature to exhibit cat nature and to tend towards cat nature. Again, this is an Aristotelian read of his biology and more broadly his metaphysics. Now, suppose you, a native Floridian, move up to my hometown in Pennsylvania and you buy a house in part because of the big apple tree in the front yard, right? So, so here you are, a, a native Miamian, native Floridian, and uh, you've always heard about these apple trees and you're thinking, you know what, I, I would like to have a big apple tree. And then you come across this home and the home has a big apple tree in the front yard and you go, you know what, I'm gonna buy the house and I'm gonna get that apple tree. So I told sometimes I don't have enough graphics. So voila, uh, there's an apple tree for you. Now, however, in the middle of September, you notice that all the leaves start turning funny colors and falling off. Oh no, you think, there's something terribly wrong with my apple tree. You call me up in a panic and you tell me what's going on. Calm yourself, I would reassure you. <clears throat> that is how apple trees are supposed to behave. It is natural for apple trees to lose their leaves in the autumn. So this is part of apple tree nature you might not be familiar with, right? If you're unfamiliar with apple trees and you didn't grow up with them around or whatnot, you might know that it is natural for apple trees to lose their leaves in the fall, right? They're deciduous plants, etc. So apple trees have a nature. And if you know apple tree nature, then you know that they lose their leaves in the fall, that they get blossoms in the spring, that they develop fruit all summer long, that over the winter they stand pretty much dormant. And this is natural for apple trees, all right? This is what apple trees do. This is what apple trees are supposed to do. However, if all your leaves start turning funny colors and falling off your tree in the middle of May, then yes, you have a problem. Why? Because apple trees aren't supposed to do that. Now you might go, well, who's Aristotle to say what apple trees are supposed to do? Uh, you're missing the point. Aristotle's not telling apple trees what they're supposed to do. Apple trees are telling Aristotle what they're supposed to do. In other words, by observing apple trees, we are able to determine what apple tree nature is. We observe apple trees, we distinguish the healthy, thriving, vigorous apple trees, we distinguish them from the withering, uh, sickly, dying apple trees, and over time we come to understand what the differences are and what apple trees are supposed to do, lose their leaves in the fall, and what they're not supposed to do, lose their leaves in the middle of spring. Now, strictly speaking, human-made products, artifacts, cannot be considered to be true substances because they do not have immutable natures, right? So what would the nature of a cell phone be? Well, the cell phones have changed quite a bit since uh, I start, got my first one, however many years ago that was, right? Uh, there was a time, believe it or not, when the only thing that cell phones were supposed to do is to make telephone calls. Right? Now, I think that's probably what it's used for least these days, right? So cell phones have these smartphones have all kinds of other uh, capacities or whatnot. So there's not one immutable nature to a cell phone or any human artifact for the most part. They are not natural kinds. Therefore, they cannot be identified with an, again, an immutable nature. Even such things as tables and chairs and beds, well, we've had them for a very long time, but their nature is not a fixed and eternal reality. Now, if a human artifact is a necessary byproduct of human nature, say like politics, Aristotle would say, then it would have a nature that is as immutable as human nature. So these days we think Aristotle was incorrect about this, but Aristotle thought that human beings uh, have an eternal uh, nature that has always existed and always would exist. We don't think he's right, but he thought so. But if that's true, if human nature is an eternal immutable reality, then anything that is a consequence of human nature, like human politics, would likewise have a constant and eternal immutable nature. So cell phones, not so much. Politics, yes. In order to know what an apple tree is supposed to do, what the apple tree things are, apple tree nature or apple tree tell us, one must engage in an empirical study of the species to see what they do do. Once I know what apple tree nature is, formal nature, 
I can tell a good, healthy apple tree from a bad, unhealthy one. But I have to know the nature first. So notice a couple of things I'm making in this, points I'm making in this slide. How do we come to knowledge of apple tree nature or apple tree form? Well, Plato told this rather fantastical story about pre-existing our bodies and having all knowledge of forms uh, uh, acquired at that time. And then we, we are incarnated and, and, and we come into this world and we bring that knowledge with us, but we forgot it and we have to spend our lives trying to retrieve it. Recall that was Plato's doctrine of reminiscence. Aristotle does not adopt the doctrine of reminiscence. What he says is, no, no, we see these natures, these forms in the world, that, uh, that the, um, the forms are in the objects themselves. And through empirical study, we are able to abstract the forms here in this life. So he doesn't have to presuppose the existence of an immortal soul. He doesn't have to presuppose some sort of prenatal uh, exchanges with forms. Why? Well, because we have access to the forms in this world, according to Plato, uh, not Plato, according to Aristotle, according to Aristotle. And this knowledge is gained through experience and observation. So again, in contrast to Plato, Aristotle thinks that observation is very important to coming to know reality, even timeless and eternal realities, and uh, it's actually indispensable. Uh, once I do know what apple tree nature is, I go on to point out, then I can tell good apple trees from bad apple trees. So preview of coming attractions, later on in this course, we'll be looking at Aristotle's um, ethics, Right, But uh, for now, I'm just referencing the idea that we can see where his ethics comes from. His ethics comes from the idea that I can tell good apple trees from bad apple trees, uh, good uh, date palms from bad date palms, good sharks from bad sharks, and good human beings from bad human beings by understanding the nature of these various uh, uh, natural objects, and then assessing the the individual relative to that nature. So a good apple tree does what apple trees are supposed to do and does it well. A good uh, shark does what sharks are supposed to do and does it well. A good human being does what human beings are supposed to do and does it well. And we'll talk more about this later, but again, preview of cunning attractions. Now, um, notice when I say that's a good shark, I don't mean that I like it or that I want it around. In fact, if you're going to throw me in a pool with a shark, I'd rather you throw me in a pool with a bad shark, right? One that has a really lousy sense of direction, one who can't really tell if there's blood in the water, one whose teeth are falling out. That's the shark I'd like to be with. I don't want to be with the good shark. In other words, the excellent shark, because those are dangerous, right? So to evaluate a thing as excellent, according to Aristotle, is not to give me some sort of um, subjective preference, it's to evaluate it relative to uh, a fixed set of evaluative criteria, the nature of the thing. That's true for sharks, that's true for date palms, that's true for cats, that's true for human beings. All right, more on that later. Through careful observation, one will be able to distinguish healthy, thriving apple trees from sick, diseased, withering apple trees. Studying the characteristic behaviors of healthy ones will reveal the nature and thus the function of the species. The normative force, in other words, the ought force, is provided by health versus disease. One ought to be healthy or excellent. One ought not to be sick or pathetic. So, Again, we'll say more about this when we look at Aristotle's ethics, but notice his ethics is not distinguishing good and bad. I'm sorry, his ethics is not contrasting good and evil. That's not the nature of Aristotle's ethics. Aristotle's ethics is contrasting good and bad, excellent and pathetic, thriving and withering. So it's a very kind of naturalistic uh, ethics. So we've talked about this briefly already. Telos is the Greek word for purpose or goal. Teleology explains an event or an object in terms of its purpose or goal or end. To say she skipped dessert because she's trying to lose weight or to say the heart contracts in order to pump blood would be teleological explanations of the behaviors of the two things. A teleology, a, a teleological uh, 
investigation, I think my slide is off of it, is one which is looking for the goal, function, or purpose of a thing. A teleological uh, worldview is a worldview that contends that reality, or at least items within reality, have goals or purposes or functions, right? And this might be global, like you think the entire purpose of the universe is to realize some goal, or it might be local, like the purpose of the heart is to pump blood or the purpose of chlorophyll is to turn light into usable energy for the plant. Aristotle's science and philosophy uh, seek to explain why, for what purpose, something came about, while modern science is interested in explaining how something came about. And it tries to uh, utilize mechanistic explanations only. So there is a difference between the uh, pre-modern science of uh, Aristotle, uh, of the medievals and scholastics, and then the modern science coming after Galileo uh, and into contemporary times. Modern science is much less likely to talk about teleology or to make use of teleological explanatory resources, and much more likely merely to talk about mechanistic forces. Notice modern physics doesn't talk about the purpose of gravity or the purpose of radiation. Modern chemistry doesn't talk about the purposes of chemical bonding, et cetera. Right? It just, they are what they are. They behave mechanistically and often according to sort of mathematical predictable laws. So my point is that causal mechanistic explanations stand in contradistinction to teleological explanations. Now, um, in terms of science, Aristotle insisted that genuine science needs to proceed in terms of logical syllogistic reasoning. Right? Um, but he also thought that it needs to, uh, a, a real scientific um, uh, argument uh, needs to consist of universal necessary first principles. So for instance, um, we start off with all men are mortal, right? And he thinks that's not just a, it happens to be the case that all men are mortal. What he's suggesting is that when I genuinely understand human nature, I understand that part of human nature is mortality. It's an essential feature. It's an ir, uh, un, uh, unavoidable feature of humankind. And then when I understand Socrates and his essence, I see that he is essentially a human being. He happens to be an Athenian, he happens to be married to Xantippe, he happens to be a veteran, but those are accidental features. He's essentially a human being. Well, then you put the two together and that means he is essentially mortal. So all three of those claims, Aristotle would say, are necessary um, and immutable claims. Um, by the way, uh, if, the, if you've already had uh, intro to logic and you've had Aristotelian syllogistics, you might realize that if we were to render this as a standard form, categorical syllogism, it should be something like this. All men are mortal things. All things identical to Socrates are things that are men. Therefore, all things identical to Socrates are mortal things. Right? So all three of them are A claimed, uh, universal affirmative claims. That's just in for gravy. I just thought I'd, I'd remind you of your syllogistic logic if you've had it already. But, uh, but my point is, is that they are all uh, supposed to be universal and necessarily true. Oh, I said this already, I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip, all right, yes. Now, there's nothing wrong with deductively valid categorical syllogisms. The problem arises, however, as to how are we supposed to get these necessary universal first principles, all men are mortal. Aristotle never satisfactorily addresses this, nor did centuries of adherence to his view of science to come after. So neither Aristotle nor the hundreds of years of philosophers that followed Aristotle ever really made um, um, a clear case on how we're supposed to get necessary uh, universal claims out of particular experiences. Three ways to characterize a substance. A substance is an essence, what is essential, for instance, uh, cat nature. Also, sometimes when he said, talks about a substance, he's referencing anything that can act as a noun, uh, that can act as the subject of predication, which is independent of anything else. 
Other things might depend on a substance, but the substance doesn't depend on them. So remember what I said earlier, that if I saw a cardinal and I say that that cardinal is red, I'm predicating red of the cardinal. That suggests that the cardinal is indeed a primary substance. Now, redness, it can only exist as a quality of primary substances. So redness would be the secondary substance going on there, right? The redness depends on the cardinal. The cardinal doesn't depend on the redness. Uh, the third sense of substance he sometimes used is a sense of substratum, right? That which underlies properties and uh, changes uh, and, change, and the changes in something, uh, usually the most basic realities. This is the sort of substance that the pre-Socratics had in mind in terms of a, a substratum. For Aristotle, this was sort of matter, sometimes referred to as prime matter. Matter, it's interesting, matter enters our discussions with Aristotle. It's discovered by Aristotle or it's invented as a concept by Aristotle. It's up to you how you wanna uh, make that out. People um, disagree, but it's essentially what stuff is made out of. It's a theoretical device that makes possible for Aristotle to explain change given its shape, um, structure and potentials by form. So without going into too much detail, we don't have to in this particular course, but if we uh, were gonna spend more time with Aristotle, you know, maybe a semester on Aristotle, I'd be pointing out that for Aristotle, his idea of matter is importantly different than our contemporary, uh, how we contem contemporarily regard matter. Um, we kind of regard matter uh, as a consequence of the way a much later philosopher, René Descartes, describes matter. And he understands matter as res extensia, stuff that is extended, right? So extended in space. Matter is that which is extended in space, we might say. That wasn't Aristotle's notion of matter, however. For Aristotle, he could imagine there being incorporeal matter or immaterial matter. You go, immaterial matter, how is that possible? Well, today that sounds very strange to us because we think of matter as almost identical with uh, material uh, uh, and materialism and physicalism. But that wasn't how Aristotle understands it. He understands matter as the ability to take on form. And so, yes, uh, physical matter can take on form, of course, but he also thought certain incorporeal things can take on form as well. And so since they can take on form, they are matter, they're just incorporeal. Uh, I don't know if I said that right, um, matter. Um, but Aristotle does insist that um, matter cannot exist without form any more than form can exist without matter. So Aristotle insists that all existing things are composite of matter and form, and matter doesn't exist on its own and form doesn't exist on its own. Now we can separate them in thought. I can intellectually imagine the matter independent of the form. I could intellectually imagine the form independent of the matter, but in reality, any bit of matter has a particular form and any actual form is the form of some bit of matter, right? Like two sides to the same coin. He mentions a prime mover, and I'll just do a quick gloss on that, right? So remember for Aristotle, a change is moving from potentially X to actually X, right? So everything which is moved, changed, derives its motion from some other thing. It moves from potential to actual by a pre-existing actuality. Now, if there is derived motion, Right? In other words, this thing derives its ability to change from something else, the pre-existing actuality. So if there's derived motion or change, then there must be a source of underived motion. Right? It can't be that every motion is borrowing its motion from somebody else. The whole thing has to have a, um, uh, a, an underived source of motion to explain why there's any motion at all. Therefore, there must be a mover or changer or actualizer. Those are sort of interchangeable for Aristotle. There must be a mover which is not itself moved or changed or actualized. This is a being with pure actuality, right? Uh, a being with no potentiality. 
So Aristotle is arguing for the existence of an unmoved mover. Don't take that too literally. Um, in his physics, the book he wrote called Physics, he does seem to be talking about um, uh, a literal mover in the sense of uh, local motion. Uh, but in metaphysics, he's more interested in the very notion of any kind of change, right? Any kind of um, movement, again, literal movement or sort of figurative movement, like um, uh, growing larger or growing smaller, et cetera, heating up or cooling down, any kind of uh, moving from one potent, from like potentially cold to actually cold or from potentially hot to actually hot. Thus, there is an unmoved mover what Aristotle wants to say, an ultimate final cause which animates the world by love. Uh, we don't need to go into too much detail here, but I just thought it's rather nice. He thinks that the way the unmoved mover achieves this is not by moving, because it's an unmoved mover, uh, it's by attraction, right? So it, uh, the unmoved mover attracts and thereby moves and animates the world. Aristotle's unmoved mover has some of the characteristics of the God of Western monotheism. But according to Aristotle, he, God, did not create the universe. Remember, Aristotle thought the universe was somewhat eternal. Uh, he had no special concern for human beings, uh, this, this uh, unmoved mover. He probably wasn't even aware of human beings, Aristotle thought, because being uh, so uh, uh, grand and beyond, uh, he would occupy his um, attention with, with only the greatest things, which would be basically himself. And the prime mover is more of a metaphysical necessity than the proper object of worship. So notice while Aristotle does seem to identify the prime mover with, with a deity or something like a deity, there wouldn't be much of a, per, a point to praying to the unmoved mover or singing hymns to the unmoved mover. And, you know, oh, unmoved mover, you move things without moving in a mysterious way, there'd be no, no point, right? He's not paying attention, doesn't really uh, have concerns for human affairs. All right, so what are some of the epistemological ramifications of Aristotle's metaphysical views? Well, number one, Aristotle insists that forms are learned through experience. We see particulars in our minds, particular cats, for instance, and we abstract the form from the cats. So whereas Plato had to suggest that we pre-existed our bodies and that's where we got to know cat form, Aristotle says nonsense, that's too far-fetched, that's too crazy. The forms exist in the cats and by observing the cats, my mind is able to abstract cat form from the particular cats. Again, no need to posit an immortal soul to explain the knowledge of abstract forms. Still, one must not imagine that we generalize to this essence. So notice uh, the, the modern uh, empiricist philosopher, John Locke. John Locke might have said this, look, I'm watching particular human beings, for instance, and I go, oh, look, that man's mortal, that man's mortal, that man's mortal. So all men are mortal, I guess. That's induction, right? Where I go from particulars and then I generalize. But inductive inference is not, an, doesn't come up with absolute necessary immutable claims, right? I might be wrong, right? So far, every man we've run into has been mortal, but maybe the next one coming down the street is um, immortal and I, there, there, goes my, uh, um, there goes my claim, right? So induction can only be established um, truth to a probability, right? Probably all men are mortal, something like that. That's not good enough for Aristotle. Aristotle thinks something else is going on, not inductive inference. He thinks that I am actually abstracting a necessary claim, all men are mortal, from my exchanges with particular human beings, right? Now, um, how does that work? Remember, I said he's never entirely successful defending that view, which is why, for instance, modern philosophers like John Locke dismiss it. And he suggests, no, I don't know necessary claims. I only know probabilistic claims through inductive inference. So Aristotle is referencing a hylomorphism, which just means all existing objects are composite of matter and form. It has a form and it has the ability to take on form, matter and form. Right? Aristotle advocated what today we would call direct 
realism, that I am directly perceiving reality. So when I see cat and I abstract cat form, what I come away with is not a representation of cat form. I actually got the cat form, right? The actual thing. Later, and we'll see this when we start to look at Descartes, later, a direct realism is criticized. And again, they often refer to it with a pejorative phrase where they talk about naive realism. And Descartes and others, modern, more, more recent philosophers, say, no, it's wrong to think that we are directly perceiving the world. What we're perceiving directly are our mental representations. I receive mental representations, and then I have to use the mental representations to tell me about the mind-independent world. But I don't get to the mind-independent world directly. We'll have a lot more to say about that later. But I'm just trying to set up the contrast between what comes after uh, um, the Aristotelian scholastic period uh, and what uh, identifies modern philosophy, which we'll, we'll kind of get into next. Now in On the Soul, Aristotle claims that the seer is informed when his mind becomes like the thing it perceives. So again, the idea is my mind takes on the form that I am perceiving, cat form, human form, date palm form, shark form, what have you. Experience for Aristotle is the source of any real knowledge of ultimate reality. And of course, this is what makes him an empiricist. Aristotle coins the phrase that nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. The empiricists to follow him all uh, um, uh, embrace that view. So that the form, if it's in my mind, it had to go through my senses, says Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle directs attention to observation of the physical world. That's how we gain knowledge. We've already said that a couple of times. He posits that we have a cognitive ability which he refers to as noose or active intellect. And this is distinguished from passive intellect. So active intellect or noose is what allows us to abstract the form according to Plato. So how does the mind get the forms of things if not through a process of generalization? Aristotle says that it is the intellect noose that has the ability to apprehend forms directly. This active function of intellect has no bodily organ in contrast to other psychological abilities, such as sense perception and imagination, which he thinks do have bodily organs, right? So your eyes are the means by which you see, your ears are that uh, the bodily organ by which you hear, but there's this active mind that isn't uh, related to a particular bodily organ. And this is what allows you to, in a sense, perceive form. Note, if the mind or soul took on the form of cat directly, but the mind or soul was itself matter, well, think about that for a minute. If what is taking on form, cat form, let's say, is matter, well, what happens when you put cat form and matter together? You get a cat, right? So why doesn't your mind turn into a cat every time you get cat form? Aristotle says, because that part of your, your you, that part of your mind, that noose, that active intellect, isn't corporeal matter. It's matter in the sense that it can take on form. It's incorporeal in the fact that it doesn't have um, extension in space. So that's why your mind does not become a cat. Since that doesn't happen, the mind must take on form without the mind itself being material. I shouldn't say being matter, I should say um, extended or corporeal. But the idea that the mind soul is one thing and the body is something else seems to contradict Aristotle's claim that the soul is nothing other than the form of the body. So I'm gonna skip over the next couple of slides because it's a little more detailed than we need to worry about. But I am saying that Aristotle's not entirely consistent here. Right? Did he think that your, the human soul was an immaterial thing? In that case, it places him a little bit in the camp of Plato. Or does he deny that the human soul is an immaterial thing and the soul is merely the form of a body? Uh, and he's not entirely consistent. So I'm going to skip. Um, in terms of philosophy and the dialectical process, philosophy 
philosophical argument must be informed by details of observation, and this will take the form of reflections and abstractions from these. So again, he differs from Plato in that he thinks that observation is indispensable for the dialectical process, for the philosophical process, for the scientific process. Some of the ethical ramifications of his metaphysical view we already touched on briefly. He does think that the attainment of knowledge of eternal forms is only part of human nature. It is a worthy life activity, but only part of a full and complete human life. So again, he wants to say, yes, we are intellectual creatures and satisfying these intellectual pursuits is part of what a full and complete human life is. But we're also familial creatures. We are also political creatures. We are also creative creatures. And so a full and complete human life, in other words, doing all and only the human things will have these other activities as part of it as well. Uh, what are the most real and attainable goals worthy of our attention and service is the fulfillment of our own human nature. And we'll have more to say about this later in the semester. As rational animals, oh, I mentioned, uh, this is his definition of human being. Man is the rational animal. Again, I'll have more to say about that later in the semester, but um, notice it's a very uh, concise definition the rational animal, three words, but each three of the three words is important, right? The, that's a definite article. He thinks we are it. We are the only ones. Maybe he was wrong, but he thought we were it, right? The rational. Notice we are rational animals, meaning that is our defining um, trait. That is what distinguishes us from other animals. Yes, we're social, but there's other social animals. Yes, we're political, but there's other political animals. Yes, we're creative, but there's other creative animals. But we're rational animals. And third, we're animals. And that is part of human nature. So unlike Plato's uh, uh, Unlike Aristotle's teacher Plato, who said you are essentially a spirit who happens for a time being to be trapped in a body, Aristotle says nonsense. You are essentially an animal. And if you ever run into a disembodied spirit someplace, there's one thing you know, not a human being. Why? Because human beings are rational animals. As rational animals, the excellent human being is the one who most fully expresses unique human nature, that is, who lives a life guided by reason, which culminates in the fulfillment of one's natural human capacities, well, such capacities as social capacities, familial, political, creative, in short, a functional human life. It's not clear whether Aristotle believed in some sort of afterlife, but the most consistent position with everything else he seems to have said would have been no. Right? Um, Aquinas paints him differently. Aquinas paints him as being somewhat friendly to the idea of an afterlife, but it's not clear that Aristotle himself really did endorse that idea. Okay, and so that brings us to the end of the second half. Right? Um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, we'll be moving on now to our next topic. Um, but this concludes my remarks on Aristotle's metaphysics and epistemology. <laughs>